Now, Lord God, we ask that you would speak to us. Lord Jesus, that you would look at us just as you looked at these disciples and tell us to come and see our Lord. Amen. Well, it's not news to any of you that we all are uh, totally overwhelmed with commercials and advertisements and posts on all kinds of different platforms that are competing for our eyeballs. Uh, flashing lights and, and flashing graphics that are telling us, look over here, come and see this. Follow me and you will see a new principle for weight loss, a new principle for exercise, for raising your kids, for uh, a new skill at work, a new DIY task that you can unlock in your house. Uh, all kinds of things, including a, a new dance to jive to, you turkeys. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I lost an hour of sleep. Just keep that in mind. There's, there's so, yeah, yeah, I know, you understand, Carol. There's so much of this out there and so much of it all the time that it, it makes us very skeptical of, of all of it, of any of these claims, of anyone who ever tells us, any ad that ever tells us to come and see anything. Uh, we, in fact, get perhaps cynical to the point when something truly great really does come along, something that we really need to come and see, something that might actually change our life, something that is actually worth following, perhaps we just turn our faces away and miss it. Well, this is exactly what the church is here to do in a unique way that no other ad or agency or organization can do or should even attempt to do. We are here to tell the world to come and see what life is about, to, to come and see your maker, to come and see the one who laid the foundations of the earth, to, to come and see the one who holds the secrets of life and the afterlife, who holds the keys of death and of Hades, whose arms stretch out upon a cross and, and whose body rose triumphant over the grave whose words melt our hearts, that they shake our chests, they enlarge our minds. Come and see. Come and see. Today's message is, is exactly that calling, that calling that Jesus told to the disciples using these very simple words, follow me, come and see. There's also a quite, a lot, uh, quite a lot in this passage as I was preparing, and I realized, uh, not too quickly, but I realized eventually that I, you know, I need to do another two-parter to do this justice. So that being said, uh, don't panic when about 30 minutes from now we're still on point one, okay? Because that's all we're gonna do is point one. So you just disregard those other two points on your piece of paper and maybe fill in the extra space with just the first point. We're just gonna address the first, Next week, we'll try to cover the next two. Uh, but the first point we're going to get to that this morning is, is this. Follow Jesus, and you will see your identity changed. Follow Jesus, and you will see your identity changed. I, I want to begin just by noting the repetition of the, this idea, this phraseology, the, this command to see Jesus, to follow him. The very first time uh, is actually in John the Baptist's words. We, we might not see it at first reading when he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And in this exclamation, G John was not only pointing out Jesus and saying something like, Look over there. There he is. Uh, but he is telling his disciples to follow Jesus, not just to look at him. John had been telling everyone that he was simply here to prepare the way for the one coming after him that the man that they should follow, that he was preparing them for. So when he finally points this man out to them, they immediately do what was expected of them, and they follow him. They heard this, and they follow Jesus. And this following of Jesus, it was not some kind of temporary pursuit. It wasn't just to investigate on John's behalf for one evening or one chance encounter. Uh, Leon Morris, in his commentary, he makes, I think, an excellent point on this when, about the grammar 
of the word and the phraseology and, and the context when he writes, the verb followed is in the tense appropriate for once for all action, which may indicate that they cast in their lot with Jesus. They did not mean to take a, a tentative inquiry, but to give themselves to him. We should also notice that the verb has both a general sense of follow and a more specific sense of follow as a disciple. In this place, both senses may be in mind. They walked down the path after Jesus and thus followed, but they also symbolically committed themselves to him. And Jesus invites them to do that. As they are following, he tells them, come and see. In verse 42, uh, Andrew brings his brother Simon to see Jesus. In verse 43, Jesus says to Philip directly, follow me. Philip goes to find Nathanael after that and, and then says to him, come and see. Th these phrases, th this idea is the most basic task of any disciple of Jesus Christ. This is the simplest response of those who have already seen Jesus is just to tell others about him, to say, come and see, follow him, look, look who I found. Uh, listen uh, to Calvin's comments on this repeated emphasis. He says, that Andrew immediately brings his brother expresses the nature of faith, which does not conceal the light or quench it, but rather spreads it in every direction. Andrew has scarcely one spark, and yet through it, he enlightens his brother. Woe to our apathy if we, who are more fully enlightened than he, do not try to make others share in the same grace. Many commentators also point out that Andrew, we only see him in two places in this, in this uh, uh, all of Scripture, really, and in John, here, and then in chapter 12, and both times, Andrew's doing the exact same thing. He's just bringing people to Jesus. He's just showing people Jesus. Uh, the Core Christianity Bible Study on John also has a helpful comment here. I've, I found, you know, normally in study and commentating, commentator readings and all this, it's pretty dry and whatnot, but this week I found a lot of good stuff, so sharing it with you. And this is a Bible study, too, that I, I recommend. It's pretty approachable and good on the Gospel of John. It says, John's account is very much the story of people pointing others to Jesus, one after another. They met Jesus and were so excited about him that they went and found their friends and family and said, you've got to come see this, because it was such good news they had to share it. Evangelism really doesn't have to be more than that. I found the way, the truth, and the life. Come and see. We don't have to have a master's degree in apologetics. We don't have to know the answer to every theological question or have a prepared speech or have our lives perfectly put together. We just need to point people to Jesus. Evangelism is simply one sick person telling another sick person where to find the doctor. We are not the doctor ourselves. We only point to him. So one way you could say this is to say that we are just like David in Psalm 34 who shouts out to everyone, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, this does not mean that it's easy. This does not mean that people won't reject our invitation. But neither does it mean that we ever give up telling people this simple phrase, come and see. We never give up on letting people hear Jesus tell them, follow me. So we invite people to church, and we say, come and see. So we, we invite people to a baptism service like we did last week, and we say, come and see, come and see everything that Jesus has done for us. And wasn't it so good to see so many families here last week? We open up the scriptures to our families at home uh, so that our little children can hear us tell them, come and see. We serve in ministries where people can come and see the word of Jesus taught and preached. When people have questions for us, when, when people encounter difficult trials in life, when people want counsel for us, all that we're doing is, at our best, opening up the Bible and, and saying, come and see. In every situation of life, in, in every season, no matter the circumstance, this is what we are doing. Come and see Jesus. You know, it, it's interesting to me that 
I think in a lot of our encounters with the unsaved world, with atheists or with uh, people who are maybe are culturally Christians, they call themselves Christians but aren't really in church, aren't active in the faith, or maybe they don't really you know, believe most of it. In most of those interactions, I think what we find is that people aren't really reading the Bible. People aren't really investigating Jesus. They're, they're assuming things about him. They're assuming things about what he said. They're assuming things about what's in the Bible and what's not in the Bible. Uh, but they haven't really come and seen him. And that's what our task is. Uh, our task sometimes maybe is just as simple as putting a Bible in somebody's hand, and other times it's, it's getting the Bible out, having it ready and, and reading. And not reading in terms of the way that a lot of the world does when they are looking for excuses to not believe, what I, what I would call a throw pillow Bible reading, uh, you know, something that's uh, small enough to be on a cross stitch, something that's small enough to be thrown on a Facebook post, something that can uh, just be lifted out of a passage without any context, but really getting people to dig into the text and to read, to, to really look and to see who Jesus is and what he has done. This is not something people are really doing. And our task is very simple, is just to help them to come and see, to read the passage, uh, to get into the text, and to see the word of God, which is living and active, take hold of their life and change them. And so what what happens then? What happens to those who, who do come? who do open their eyes, who do follow Jesus. Well, the first thing that's shown in our text is what is said to Peter in John 1, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Jesus gave Simon a new identity. Now, Cephas and Peter both mean rock, just in two different languages. Cephas is in Aramaic, which is like uh, the uh, common tongue of Hebrew at the time. And then Peter is in Greek, so Cephas and Petros. Uh, Please note also, this might be a little confusing at first, that Peter is called Simon Peter earlier in the text, Uh, but this here is, is not his name yet. This is the narrator's comment to a reading audience that already knows Peter as Simon Peter. Uh, But he, at this point in the story, is only Simon, and he is given the new name Peter here uh, in this text. Uh, So, as Leon Morris writes, Simon is from this time Jesus' man, but he's also a different man. And the new name points to his character as the rock man. Peter appears in all the Gospels as anything but a rock. He's impulsive, volatile, unreliable, but that was not God's last word for Peter. Jesus' renaming of the man points to the change that would be wrought in him by the power of God. A little bit more simply, the Reformation Study Bible says, when God assigns a new name, he is redefining the person and his destiny. For Peter, this new name, this new destiny, in fact, means a number of things for him, at least three that we're going to look at. And the first is this, that we can't overlook, we can't go past the simple privilege it is to be noticed by Jesus, let alone to be spoken to by Jesus, let alone alone to be given a new identity, a new name by Jesus personally, directly. And that's the first thing that this naming of Peter means. What a privilege to be named by the Messiah, the Son of God, the cosmic king, the the one who names all the stars now turns and and locks eyes with Peter and gives him a name. And remember who it is we're talking about. Remember in the context of John chapter 1 who it is we're talking about. John the Baptist, who is a prophet like uh, Elijah, he says this about Jesus, He who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John the Baptist feels unworthy to touch the dirty sandals of Jesus. More than that, he is saying, as in the first century, servants and slaves would be tasked in a home with taking care of guests by by taking sandals off and washing feet. John the Baptist is saying, I am not worthy to be Jesus' slave. 
That's the same exalted Jesus who looks Peter in the eyes and speaks a new name to him. But Peter's new naming is also a kind of picture for what Christ does for all of us who follow him. He offers himself, he offers his gospel promise to all of us just as he did to Peter, just as Peter will say later in Acts chapter 2, for the promise is for you and for your children and, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And that is us. Again, I stumbled across a lot of stuff this week. Here's, here's another one. The Men's Book Club, just this last week, uh, we've been in uh, Knowing God. And just this last week, there's a really uh, great analogy here for this understanding of the privilege it is to know God, uh, let alone be in any way positively associated with him. J.I. Packer writes, Imagine now that we are going to be introduced to someone whom we feel to be above us whether in rank or intellectual distinction or professional skill or personal sanctity or in some other respect. The more conscious we are of our own inferiority, the more we shall feel that our part is simply to attend to this person respectfully and let him take the initiative in the conversation. Think of meeting the Queen of England or the President of the United States, maybe a past President of the United States. Uh, we'd like to know and get to know this exalted person, but we feel, fully realize this is a matter for him to decide, not us. If he confines himself to courteous formalities with us, we may be disappointed, but we do not feel able to complain. After all, we had no claim on his friendship. But if instead, he starts at once to take us into his confidence and tells us frankly what it is in his mind on matters of common concern, and if he goes on to invite us to join him in particular undertakings he has planned and asks us to make ourselves permanently available for this kind of collaboration whenever he needs us, then we shall feel enormously privileged. If life seemed unimportant and dreary hitherto, it will not seem so anymore. Now that the great man has enrolled us among his personal assistants, here is something to write home about and something to live up to. Now this, so far as it goes, is an illustration of what it means to know God. What happens is that the Almighty Creator, the Lord of hosts, the great God before whom the nations are as a drop in a bucket, comes to you and begins to talk to you through the, wor through the words and truths of Holy Scripture. And one day you wake up to the fact that God is actually speaking to you, you, through the biblical message. Let, let us never grow accustomed to hearing the words of the Almighty, to hearing words that are truly spoken to you. And not only does God just associate himself with you and talk with you, but he declares your name. He declares your name to all as a friend, as a child, as a citizen of heaven. Listen to Revelation 3. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. For those who follow Jesus, a day will come when the thunderous voice of the King of Kings will shake heaven with the sound of your name. So the first thing we see in this passage is that Peter's new name reminds all of us of the great privilege it is to be spoken to and to be named by Christ. The second thing we see of Peter's naming is something that applies really only to him, uh, but it is worthy of mention, that Peter here is also named as one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of the apostles here, and so it's important for John to point that out, to, to make that clear. Uh, and so he is going to be one of the 12 that will be entrusted to represent his message after his crucifixion and his resurrection and ascension. And Peter, in some way, though we don't know, want to make too much of this, is seen as a leader of the apostles. Not as a pope, but as a leader, especially to the Jewish people. Um, Paul will take up a similar role, but with a focus to reach the Gentiles. Uh, and so Peter, you know, Jesus' rock man, 
uh, is the one who will be used by the Spirit to give the first gospel sermon at Pentecost. But Peter, who in Matthew 16, 18, is said by Jesus, I tell you, you are Peter, rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is making a play on words here with Peter's name, the name he gave him, Uh, but in this passage, the rock is not so much Peter as it is the message of Jesus that Peter will proclaim. Nonetheless, the message itself uh, is what makes Peter a rock, is what gives Peter this new identity is what sets him apart in a special way that he could never have imagined before. So second, Peter is set apart in a way that we are not as an apostle. But there's a third reason for Jesus' naming of Peter, and that relates directly to us. Peter's naming is an example of the gracious gospel that Peter would proclaim. Peter, after all, was a man who denied Jesus three times, And in that context is, I think, compared with Judas. He's a man to whom Jesus at one point said, get thee behind me, Satan. How would you like to hear that from Jesus? He's a man who took a very long time in the early church to understand the need for salvation to Gentiles, and even Paul had to call him out publicly for it, to discipline him. The same flawed, brash, conflicted Peter is God's rock man. This is not a description of who he was, but of who the Lord would make him to be. It's not a title that he earned. And the same is true for all of us. The gospel is a message for sinners, not for saviors. The gospel is a message that, that we have of a Savior, a good news that we simply point people to him. And just like Peter, the Savior calls to all of us to follow, gives to all of us a new name, a redeemed identity, and his naming of us changes everything wrong about our identity forever. 1 Corinthians 6 puts it this way, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of God of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Those who believe in Christ, people from every kind of sinful background are cleansed from all of their past sinful identity. Not because of something they have done. It's not because they've turned a new leaf and they've adopted some better lifestyle choices. This is not what it means to follow Jesus. No, those who follow Jesus are not merely adopting a lifestyle. They are a people whose lives are changed and made new by Jesus. The Jesus who took on their sin, who died their death, who suffered their punishment, and who gave them a new identity before God. He gave us a better identity. We are Christians. We identify with Christ. He is the best thing about us. Please take special note, too, of this phrase, such were some of you. This means that everything in that list did describe the past life of some in the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth was pretty large from what we know, so there was a large sum in that understanding. But it was now forever in the past. Such were some of you, not such are some of you. Christians no longer identify themselves with their sins, but with their Savior. And yet, we we need to take special note of this phrase because uh, the sexual revolution of our time has warped this understanding even for Christians uh, and their past identity. There's a growing segment in the church of people who deny this passage in in an attempt to be less confrontational. 
especially to those who are wrapped up in the ever-growing sexual revolution acronym, LGBTQ+. They attempt to divide especially homosexual identity into two groups. And they call it Side A and Side B. Side A are those who believe that there's nothing wrong with a homosexual identity or activity or desire. Side B are those who will claim that at least homosexual activity is wrong, but the desire, the identity, maybe not. And side B homosexuals have no problem even identifying with their past sin and calling themselves gay Christians. Now this kind of idea leads to a false understanding of the Christian's identity and really a denial of the Lord's words here, such were some of you. It, it really stunts the power of the new birth and is as silly really as a Christian calling himself an alcoholic Christian, a, a womanizing Christian, a covetous Christian, if you want to get to the heart of the matter, a, a lying Christian, a selfish Christian, a thieving Christian. This is not the way we define ourselves. And in response to this, many faithful uh, churches have put together materials to help combat this damaging false teaching. One of those that uh, I've pointed you to in the past was put together by the Presbyterian Church in America, and it was a study committee that they formed back in 2020, I think, and uh, this is just part of that statement, statement nine. I think I still have some of these printed in the office, maybe, uh, if you are interested, and this is what it says. To juxtapose identities rooted in sinful desires alongside the term Christian is inconsistent with biblical language and undermines the spiritual reality that we are new creations in Christ. That is, we name our sins, but are not named by them. Isn't that good? We name our sins, but we are not named by them. Because Jesus gave us a new name. He takes away that old man. He takes away those old names. He, he takes away those old identities, and he buries them in his tomb forever. They don't rise with him. So then what are we named by? Well, listen again to the words of our Lord. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So that if you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you were washed. You're a person who enters the church and the kingdom through the washing of the Holy Spirit. You're a person baptized into Jesus Christ and have had all of your sins washed away. If you claim the name of Jesus, you were sanctified. You're a person who has been specially set apart for God. You are his own. You are his child. You stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and you stand before the throne of God. Your place there is secured. If you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you were justified. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The charges that would have been brought against you were brought against Christ instead, and he paid them all to the very last letter so that the Father has declared you already righteous and acquitted and free and cleared of all charges. If you claim the name of Christ, this is your identity now. The people who are named by the Heavenly Father, named by the Savior, Jesus Christ, named by the Spirit with these words, washed, sanctified, justified. Do you believe our Lord's name for you? Do you identify yourself with these words? Do you believe what they say of you even if your desires tell you something different? Do you believe what they say of you even if you are tempted to doubt it? What name do you go by? The one your sins gave you? The one Satan would love to use to slander you? or the name of Jesus Christ and the name that he gave to you, the name that is above all other names. If you follow Jesus, you will see your identity changed, changed forever. Would you pray with me?